Let's look at God's word together. James 5.13 says, Is any of you in trouble? He should pray. You know, the early church experienced lots of trouble. And we experience lots of trouble today. Believe me, especially in the Middle East, the church is experiencing plenty of trouble. The good news is the same God who answered prayer 2,000 years ago answers our prayers today. Now, sometimes we get shocking news. We've worked for a company a long time and suddenly they downsize and we find ourselves unemployed. Or, worse yet, we go to a doctor wondering what's going on in our body and we find out that it's cancer or something like that. All the time, we're faced with troubles. What can we do? We can go straight to the Lord in prayer. Yet if we're honest about this, why is it that we tend to do that only as a last resort? Like our own speech gives us away when we say, oh, there's nothing we can do but pray. Perhaps the Lord wants us to pray as a first resort. This is what we see in the early church. I want us to turn to the book of Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 beginning at verse 1. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread, which is the Passover. After arresting Peter, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. I'm going to stop there and then we'll continue on. What's going on? Let's look at the context. First of all, who is this Herod? that has arrested Peter. You know, there are at least four Herods mentioned in the New Testament. This is Herod Agrippa I. This would be the grandson of, the, of Herod the Great who tried to kill Jesus after he had been born. Remember the Magi came to Herod? That would be Herod the Great, the grandfather. And Herod said, Search for the child, and then come and tell me so that I too may go and worship him. Instead, not wanting a rival king, he goes after Jesus. The Lord warns Joseph to take the child and, and, and marry his mother and, and, and slip off to Egypt. And Herod goes after Jesus by, by, killing, by slaughtering every child under two. Imagine this, every, every son under two in the region of Bethlehem. Terrible, terrible thing. Now that gives you an idea of the, of the character of Herod the Great. Now his son, one of his sons, was Herod Antipas. That's the man that had the head of John the Baptist uh, put on the platter because his daughter Herodias had danced before him at a dinner party and he had said, I'll give you up to half the kingdom, anything you want. And she said, give me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so they executed him. Now, this was also the same Herod that Jesus went before in his trial. 
So picture this. Now there's a generation later, Herod Agrippa I. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to win brownie points among the unbelieving Jews as the persecution begins to rise up. And, and he sees that it pleased the Jews to execute James. Now, James is the James, Peter, James, and John in the cell boat that we sing about in, in Sunday school. Jesus' inner circle. Now picture this. You're in the early church, and one of Jesus' inner circle disciples has been executed. And now they pick up Peter with the intention of putting him on public display, public trial, wait for the Passover to get done so we can execute him too because more is better. What do you think the church is thinking at this point? We've already lost one. Now we're going to lose Peter? But I want us to see that the key verse is five. So Peter was kept in prison, but... The church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now the word earnestly in the NIV is a little bit weak. The word in the Greek is ektenos. And ektenos literally means stretched out. They're praying stretched out. Meaning they're praying all night. They're praying day after day. They've gathered together and they are praying intensely for Peter to be spared. And friends, that's an insight into the early church that we need to see and we need to get a vision for ourselves because it's stretched out prayer that brings results. Now, Herod Agrippa was no dummy. And he decides that we must make sure that nothing happens to Peter so that we can get through the week of Passover and bring him out to trial. They give him double security. That's four squadrons of four soldiers each. They have 16 men guarding Peter, plus sentries. Humanly speaking, this is a dismal situation. There is no way he's going to get out except God intervenes supernaturally. And it's into those very situations that God wants us to pray in a stretched out and persevering manner. Now, what did Jesus teach about prayer? A lot of things. But some of the things he taught. First, we can address Almighty God as our Abba. That was unique to Jesus. Jesus was the first one to come along and call God Abba. And it literally means Daddy. Plus, he actually invites us as his people to pray to Daddy. That's the first thing. Secondly, Jesus makes him emphatically clear that we are to be persistent in our prayer. Think, for example, of what he says here. In Luke 11, Jesus said, Suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at night and say, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine's come on a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, Don't bother me. The door's already locked. My children are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, Jesus said, even though you will not get up and give him the bread because of his friendship, yet because of his persistence, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. Plus, Jesus gave parables about a, persi about a persistent widow that keeps going to a judge and saying, give me justice. I won't leave you alone until you do it. So Jesus is literally saying that we should pray that way with God. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes... My prayer is more like, you know, Lord, if it's your will, would you allow this to happen? But that's not really the, the way the Lord wants us to pray. He wants us to plead with Him. He wants us to keep asking. 
He's perfectly okay with, okay, Jim, you're not understanding the situation, you're not seeing the big picture, and I have to say no. He can do that. But we're his children, and we're addressing God as Abba, Daddy. And I think he wants us to plead with him, to persevere in praying. And it moves the heart of God when we do. And so I want to encourage us to see this for what it is and to pray accordingly. Now, God does respond to the pleas of his people. And I'm going to read 7 and on. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, and he woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea that what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. Did you ever stop to think, what, what's going on there? How did it open up by itself? i got to believe it's other angels. They're just, not, they're just invisible. They're doing the work. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people were gathered and were praying. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. Now, friends, I want you to realize something here. Sometimes we think we don't pray because we just sort of lack faith. Hey, they struggled with prayer too. Think about this. They're praying a whole week for Peter's deliverance. Peter gets delivered and they don't even believe it. Oh, they think, oh my goodness, he's gone. His angel. Now, we won't get into the theology of angels here. It's a bad theology. But they, they think Peter's dead because his angel has come to sort of report that he's gone. They don't even believe that it's him. I also want you, want you to see that I think Peter was resigned to the idea that I'm going home. I think he was sleeping peacefully because he'd already had it in his heart that I'm done. Tomorrow I'm going to be executed, put on trial, and executed, and I'll join the ranks of other martyrs. But God had other plans. And it's so unreal to Peter, he doesn't even think it's happening. It's, it's like a vision, it's like a dream, but it really is happening. And then he has the aha moment. If, this is, if God has just delivered me through an angel supernaturally, Somebody must be praying. A prayer meeting must be going on. Now friends, this is the fourth watch of the night. It's probably 3 to 4 a.m. And he realizes if prayer is going on, it's probably happening at Mary's place because that's where they would have prayer vigils because it was a large enough house that they had a, a, probably a courtyard a servant named Rhoda. And so this is probably something that had been going on for quite some time. And I love it. In the middle of the night, he arrives. And Rhoda doesn't, Rhoda's shocked. Rhoda goes back to the group and says, Peter's at the door, and they don't even believe her. 
Now, how much faith there? I want you to see that God will honor our prayers even when we have doubts. And even when we struggle, God can still use our prayer. And He wants our prayer. So I hope, I know for me it's an encouragement. I hope it is for you as well. Let me just say that in the past several years, we have seen wonderful answers to prayer. You know, the Middle East is under terrible pressure. ISIS is moving in the region. And by the way, ISIS is openly threatening Bahrain now. When ISIS threatens Bahrain, you take it seriously. We're, we're so on alert, on alert that the government is forcing churches to get extra security. We're going to have cameras and the whole works. And they're telling us, be on guard. Watch out. It's an interesting situation because ISIS is really made up from radical Sunni Muslims. And since most of our population is Shia, it's a serious threat. The reality of it is, is that the first thing ISIS does when they move into a community is they wipe out the Shia. Then they persecute the Christians. They go and they put the letter, the Arabic letter noon on the doors and walls of Christians marking their houses as if to say, here's where you should persecute. And some of them get killed and most of the time they get moved out. So then, if that's not enough, the third group they go after is all of the Sunni Muslims that don't agree with their radical policies. So basically, if you're having a hard time understanding ISIS, think of it this way. They hate everybody but themselves. It's just that the order is Shia Muslims, the Christians, and those that don't go along with their program. Now, the good news, friends, is God is on the move in the Middle East. And even though you're not going to hear much in the uh, press or the media, I, I'm telling you, as somebody who's there in the Middle East, God is doing incredible things there. God's people are praying, and there's breakthroughs happening. And we, just, we, we praise God. I'm going to give you some examples. A year and a half ago, the American Mission Hospital experienced a board uprising. Now, how, how do you experience a board uprising? Their board was made up of majority Muslims. And they took over the hospital. They fired the, the Christian uh, CEO, our friend George, and literally canceled his visa, put his name in the paper with, with two other uh, top executives. It, it was incredible. It was like a coup d'etat. What could be done? They, they literally locked them out of the building. George says, we got to get people praying intensely, stretched outedly. And for the next week, that's exactly what the church did. Now, let me tell you how it ends. First of all, the, the Reformed Church in America actually appealed to the king of Bahrain and to the American ambassador. And it just so happened that a week before this coup occurred, the American ambassador had actually visited the American Mission Hospital, saw what a tremendous ministry it was, and was familiar with what we saw as an upcoming problem. Secondly, it just so happened that the American ambassador sat next to the king in a major dinner. And the king asked him, so how are things? And he said, we have a problem at the American Mission Hospital. And it's serious. The king says, I want you in my chambers when the dinner is over. He spent over an hour with the American ambassador. Filled in on what was going on. The king said, give me 48 hours. 
and this problem will, will be resolved. Literally, he intervened. And within 48 hours, George was reinstated. The old board was gone, the rogue board that had taken over. And, and, and these coup leaders were out. Since then, the Reformed Church in America has reconstituted a brand new board. And now we have more opportunities than we've probably had in 30 or 40 years. Now friends, we came this close to losing the American Mission Hospital. God's people prayed and the Lord intervened and gave us more than we could imagine. This all happened in March 2015. It's that recent. Now a year later, we've been promised land. They can expand. Is God good? Is God good? But you know what? God would not have done that without, the, without people stretch outedly praying. So this is, this is the thing that's so amazing is he expects us to participate in his plans. And that's exactly what we need to do as God's people. Now in a much less dramatic fashion, I can say that in the last year or two in the English language congregation, we've seen, it's less dramatic, but we've seen a profound change take place. And what, what has happened is we become very missional. It's like the seeds that were being sown for five, six years, all of a sudden they took root. We have a board that's excited about sending our people on mission trips. We are involved in South Sudan in a wonderful way. Last March, I had an opportunity to go with one board member and a former board member who happens to be a doctor and she happens to be a nurse. We went to evaluate the situation. What a poor country. What a difficult situation. We came back and raised 10,000 US dollars to set up a children's clinic in Bohr. And, and we're making plans to go back there with a team of doctors to give free cataract operations and some other operations. There are blind people that all they need is a specialist to come in. And we're going to provide that. So here we are, a church in the Middle East getting involved in South Sudan, a country that's been wracked with over 30 years of civil war. Is that good? Praise God. That is a miracle. Then, last, this past June, we sent five English language congregation members to Telangana, a, region, a poor and needy region there. And they did village ministries, uh, did some orphanage work and some other things. They came back on fire. This is what happens. They come back, they're all excited about mission. Now other people want to go. During the summer, I, I come back here for seven weeks to, to speak in churches that support us. But two, one of them is a board member, is, is doing a week-long mission. Another is the wife of a board member, and she is on the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan, a very, very dangerous area, radical Muslims. You know, the Taliban is there. And she was there three weeks. She just came back. It's so exciting, all at the support of the English language congregation and, and people rising up and praying for this. I'm telling you, God is doing some amazing things. We have, there's so many things I want to share with you. How are we doing for time? Are we nearing the end? Preach it. I, okay. You know, you kind of remember, I do tend to be a little long-winded. I, I have notes so that I stay on course. But I'm not looking at the notes, so look out. <laughs> There's a wonderful book that a man named Tom Doyle has written. It's called Dreams and Visions. It was written four years ago. And it shows account after account of how God is showing up in the dreams of Muslims. And it's, it's one way or another sowing seeds and leading 
to people coming into a relationship. I'm going to give you one of the accounts. Uh, who would you say is the toughest sort of Muslim to reach for Jesus? Wh wh who would you guess? Any, what's that? A Sunni. No, that's a good guess. Sunni. Anyone else guess? A jihadist. I thank you. A terrorist. Right? But I want you to know that terrorists are coming to Jesus in amazing numbers in every country in the Middle East. Again, the media won't tell you that. But it's happening because Jesus is showing up in their dreams. But the toughest group of people, according to Tom Doyle, is the imam. The imams are basically the lay preachers whose job it is to make sure Muslims are following their Quran. Think of them like Pharisees with a Quran in their hand. Okay? They're just waiting to nail you. And Muslims have, are terrified of these imams. They tend to be arrogant. They tend to be angry. But listen to the story. Hassan wakes up startled to a rough hand over his mouth and a cold muzzle of a gun to his head. Don't say a word. Get up and come with me. His kidnapper shoves him through the streets of old Cairo. This was in Egypt. Hassan was known for his strong evangelizing of Muslims. Now he figures he's been turned in. It's over. So he prays on the way, Lord, help me to be faithful in my witness to the end. That's a good prayer. Lord, help me to be faithful in my witness to the end. He's taken to an old abandoned warehouse. This is like 3 o'clock in the morning. Where, where 10 obviously Muslim men are sitting in a circle. He's told to sit down. He sits down. And then he notices that the 10 people smile at him. And the whole atmosphere changes. We are imams. And we studied at Al-Azhar University. And during our time there, each of us had a dream about Jesus. And each of us has privately become a follower of Jesus. For a time, we didn't dare tell anybody. It would have been our own death sentences. But finally, we could hide it no longer. And we prayed for Jesus to help us to learn what it means to follow him. Over time, Jesus led us to each other. And the Holy Spirit actually revealed to them there are other imams that have become followers of Jesus. And now we imams gather three times a week in the middle of the night to pray for our families and to pray for the people in our mosques to come to know Jesus, to find Jesus as Lord. I'm sorry we had to frighten you like this, but it was the only way we could do it safely. I apologize. Now, the question is, would you please teach us about the Bible and show us what it means to follow Jesus? That's in Cairo. I could go on and tell you other stories. You know, in Mecca, it is the death sentence if you are a non-Muslim. Did you know that? You cannot go to Mecca. You have to have papers. But there's one person that's showing up in dreams and in visions among the Muslims when they're on Hajj. And that's the Lord Jesus. And so there's actually, a, there's actually a man named Muhammad, ironically, who's leading a secret church in Mecca. This is what's going on. And then there's Iran. Friends, Iran is right across from the Persian Gulf. And Iran is hostile to the Christian faith. But the government doesn't know what to do because Jesus keeps showing up in the middle of the night and whole villages are turning to the Lord in Iran. There's a revival going on in Iran. You'll never hear about this in the media. The government just simply doesn't know what to do with it. I love it because the, the, the chapter in the book of Tom Doyle's book, it, it says, um, why Ahmed... Ahmadinejad can't sleep at night. I'm telling you, I want you to get that book and read about it. In closing, friends, I want to draw some lessons from our passage. 
First of all, I want us to see that there are benefits when we gather together as God's people and pray. There seems to be more power in praying together when two or three are gathered, there is Jesus in the midst of them. Now listen to this. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, Jesus said it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So, the most important thing that you can do and the most important thing that we can do in the Middle East is actually be praying that God intervene and God move. Secondly, I want us to realize that God will honor our prayer efforts despite our struggles. We don't have to have perfect faith. We just have to trust enough to keep praying and ask the Lord to intervene. As we've said, I don't think Peter was expecting it. And certainly, the people praying were not expecting an answer like that. And you know what? I don't blame them. They'd already lost James. So it, it's a mystery as to why God chooses to intervene in one situation. He doesn't intervene the way we would like him in another. But God is sovereign, and he is working in, the, in our midst. And we're at war, friends. You know, and I'm not talking about, you know, in the first century, the, the public enemy number one wasn't Herod Agrippa. It was Satan who was just using Herod Agrippa for his own purposes. ISIS is an enemy, but it's Satan that's empowering ISIS to do what it's doing. And God is, God is moving powerfully, probably more in the Middle East today because of the amazing dislocation. The refugees are pouring into Europe and the refugees are coming to the United States. And, and Americans are nervous, and I get that. And I do believe we've got to vet that. But I praise God that in the midst of that, people are turning in record numbers to Jesus. They're coming into a relationship. This is the greatest hour for mission to the Islamic world. And that is why I want to encourage us to really pray um, the last thing I want to say before I'm actually going to, we're going to spend some time praying, is that nothing's impossible for God. Believe. Pray expectantly for the impossible because we serve the God of the impossible. One reason why we should pray, God can do more in a second than we can do on our own in a lifetime. So it's the most strategic thing we can do is pray and to pray in a, concerted way together. It is not the greatness of my faith that moves mountains, but, the, but our faith in the greatness of our God. That he loves us, that he hears us, and that he will respond to our cries. Amen? So what I would like us to do now, because I've shared a little bit about what's going on in the Middle East, we want to actually do some praying. I want us to take five five or ten minutes, break down into groups of two or three, and let's pray for God to move in the Middle East, for God to move in Bahrain, for whatever your need is. And you know, it can be a wayward son or daughter. It can be somebody struggling with a drug problem. It can be somebody just diagnosed with an awful disease. Ask God to intervene. He's powerful and nothing is too hard for him. So we'll do that. Let's just pray right now. Father in heaven, thank you that you love us. That you are our Abba, our Daddy. That we can address you as our Abba. And Lord, we thank you that we can take to you our troubles. Is any one of us in trouble? We should pray. So Lord, we're going to take five to ten minutes right now. And we're going to agree together for you to continue to move in powerful ways in our midst here in the United States and in the Middle East. 
And we give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's just do that right now. We'll move into just form groups, two or three. And let's pray. faithfulness to you and Lord for his desire to serve you and Lord I ask you to guide him by your precious Holy Spirit I pray that you will make you open up doors that no man can close and you close the doors that you want closed that no man can open and Lord you that you'll make it really clear as to the, the best thing he can be doing in the years ahead. And Father, thank you for the way you do guide us and that, that you, that we can hear your voice. I pray that you would enable Jason more and more to hear your voice and to be responsive and obedient to your prompting and to your leading. And Lord, thank you for the fruit of his life and I pray for increased fruit and increased Holy Spirit anointing upon him. Thank you, Lord, that he, that he enjoys preaching. And I pray that that would just increase the anointing for that, Lord. Use him powerfully in his context. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray that you would show up in the in dreams of Muslims that we know, Lord. Lord, that we've been praying for. Father, we pray for Stephen's team, his teammates, Lord. And uh, we pray for his coaches, Coach Salah especially, Lord. We pray that, that Lord Jesus, show up, in his, show up in his dreams. And Lord, we know that he would ask us about so, Father, we just pray that he would, he and, and the others, Lord, that they'd call upon the name of the Lord Jesus and be saved. And, Lord, we, we just pray that you continue to draw people to yourself. In Jesus' name.
throughout the world, we have heard amazing things that you are doing, and we praise you for that. God, we come boldly before you today that you would move in this place, that you would move in this country, that you would move throughout the world as you already have been moving, God. It is exciting to hear, exciting to hear of your power at work in places we couldn't possibly imagine. And Lord, we pray that, that that would continue. And Lord, that you would show us how we can be a part of that too. Again, that you would guide us, that you would give us your vision and your heart. Or that we would listen to your voice, the voice of your spirit, not the voice of politicians and media, not the voices that would, would seek to divide us, Lord, but that you would guide us where it is that you are calling us to. Father, we pray for the Middle East. With such unrest, such violence, such uh, conflict, Lord, that, that in and amidst that, hearing the reports of what you're doing, we pray that that would continue. We pray for continued revival. Lord, we pray for ISIS. Something that seems difficult for us to do. But we pray, we pray for those who would seem to be our enemies, that you would move in their hearts. We pray for the Christians around the world who are persecuted because of them, that you would rise them up and strengthen them in your name, that they may give a testimony of your love and your grace, that many, many would come to know you. And Lord, we pray for, for us here too, for so many unnamed prayer requests that pass in and out of this place every week. Lord, move powerfully. As the psalmist writes, Lord, show us amazing things that you have done. Show us your miraculous deeds for all mankind. And that we could also pray, Lord, not to us, but to your name. Be all glory and honor and praise because of your love. We lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen.